Hello and welcome to the Geotech Hour. I'm so excited to have a really esteemed group of panelists here today to talk about the geopolitics of tech design and how do we really think about making human-centered choices at global scale. I'd like to first turn to our panel, uh, each of our panelists, ask them to introduce ourself, themselves. Um, but first let's start with uh, Andy Cunningham. Andy, I would love for you to introduce yourself and speak to why does global tech design matter? How can we use it to actually improve the world? Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I come from a background in social psychology and in systems change, and so kind of accidentally arrived into the field of design and currently work as a catalyst for creative thinking um, in a range of sectors. And I think um, for me, what is behind uh, design and tech design is the idea of creative problem solving. So it can be this force for good in shaping the way that we think, the way we bring different voices into the conversation to shift our perspective um, and to unpack what those challenges are. You know, tech design matters because technology is pervasive. It's everywhere and it influences everything. And it's really easy to associate tech design with the for-profit sector, but it's actually an opportunity to think more broadly um, in the not-for-profit sector, the public sector, and to reframe tech design specifically with disruption, but actually for generative and positive change. So that's for me why I think as we shift from human-centered to humanity and environment-centered design, Technology is a really key enabler in that journey. And Andy, just as a quick follow up, can I ask you to speak a bit to your incredible work at Design Thinking Zeal and the kinds of conversations that you're curating and how they support conversations around, around tech design and design overall? Absolutely. So at the Design Thinking Zeal, one of the things we're really passionate about is bringing different different voices into the conversation, knowing that the way we shape and evolve the conversation around design needs to uh, address some of the problems around um, the, the whiteness problem that design has so that we are more inclusive, that we're broadening the way we, the like the mental models that we're bringing to it. And so as the co-founder of the Design Thinking Zeal, I have the privilege and the opportunity to actually tap into the scope of the design world and profile stories that um, are coming from both the global north, the south, every industry um, to really kind of um, broaden the horizon around uh, design and, and tech design. Well, thank you so much for your contribution to that area. And I just want to, again, acknowledge that, that some of our participants today have come out of those conversations. So thank you for incubating them, and I'm excited to share. Nick, I would love to turn to you next with the same question. First off, please do introduce yourself. And then if you could tell us why global design matters, how we can be using it to, to change the world and improve humanity. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to, to, to talk to that. And thanks first for uh, including me in this. So. I'm Nick Delamere. I'm responsible for, uh, for the North American practice of a, an organization called Fjord, or a pretty uh, massive design organization globally, uh, 2,000 some odd people sort of spread around the world. Um, and global design is, is crucial to what we do. I mean, it's worth pointing out, I think I'm a designer by training. So I went to school for graphic design, have an industrial design background, and sort of have been in the industry long enough to see it change shape a number of different times. Uh, obviously, sort of, you know, there was a, a, a disconnect, or, or, you know, if you go back a little ways between engineering and design, design was sort of a layer that was put on top of sort of physical objects. Um, as digitization happened, sort of design and engineering became more closely intertwined. So technology and, and sort of the ornamentation became sort of one and the same. And then design sort of in its desire to get a seat at the board in the boardroom sort of in a sense became more and more sort of akin to the businesses that we, we work with. So I've sort of witnessed this happen as a as a as a practitioner on the hands, sort of like the, the making side of things. And I think one of the things that we've realized is that sort of especially in the time of digitization, is that sort of 
anything that we say, even if it's hyper local, is going to be heard globally. And so it becomes incredibly important for those sort of for us to be aware of what those things are and to sort of bring, I mean, you know, we we, we you already the whiteness problem was sort of mentioned and 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 that we start to recognize and sort of uh, sort of uh, and, and mirror in a sense the populations that we're going to be serving for and become much more self-aware around sort of the impact we have out in the world. So to me, I think um, the, the importance of it is very simple, sort of this conversation is that these things can't be se separated or divorced anymore, um, and that designers and design as a whole and humans going beyond human-centered design into sort of, as was mentioned, sort of inclusive design, service systems design, all of these other sort of nomenclatures that sort of speak to that evolution of the craft. We're bringing them all back together again, um, and so these kind of this uh, uh, and recognizing that it's not a fixed point, and recognizing that the craft is changing, and the tech and design really are sort of very much merged. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And just can I ask you to speak a little bit more to to setting the context for what does it mean to be human centered or sort of science? to give our audience a bit of a context because they may not necessarily be encountering. Yeah, it's a, it's. I mean, I think we'll we'll probably all speak to it in different in different degree to different degrees. Human centered design is a it's a really interesting kind of concept and and almost um, a political action in terms of what design can be. I mean, design was again sort of really centered around sort of the object or the 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 thing that you were going to be designing against, using the the your and, and considering your constituents as sort of the 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 buyers of that service or the business or the sort of the organization that was sort of like in a sense paying the bills. Human-centered design at, at the outset sort of took, tried or worked to take the power away from the sort of the, the payer and then really look at much more deeply the people who are going to be using the system and service that you were that you were creating. Uh, and, and in doing so, it sort of it, it democratized design to some degree in a way that hadn't been done before. The simple version of it is really that we should understand the people that we're designing, the constituents that we're designing for and work on their behalf rather than simply working on the behalf of the organizations that sort of are paying the bills. Um, and now we're realizing, I would say, that sort of going beyond sort of the, the notion of the individual human into sort of humanity as a whole or sort of the impacts that the that, that, that social cultural systems have on an individual is as important as looking at that individual because we're not you know, alone in the world, right? Like we, we, we need others around us. And so we're starting to see even in that human-centered design context sort of a move sort of beyond the individual and into a broader set of, of people and systems and services. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, I'd like to turn to Pierce now um, and, and, and really pick back up on something that Nick said about talking about design that can happen in very hyper-local choices, but then have very global ramifications. Can you speak about, about how you've seen that tech design plays out on a global stage? What are the key sure. challenges? And of course, please do introduce yourself and set the context for our audience as well about your background. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Pierce Oklahile Gordon. Uh, if you want to, that's a bit confusing on the back end. Call me Dr. P, Dr. OG, all of those work. Um, so I'm here uh, representing the as the Equity Innovation Director uh, of Think Rubik's, a consultancy that operates in the states, while also sitting here in Botswana, specifically uh, Khabarone which speaks to the tension that I've seen in my own work um, as an innovation researcher, as an interdisciplinarian, uh, specifically dealing with the ideas of uh, human-centered design. Um, I want to speak a little bit about a story that consistently comes to mind. Um, I got here starting my PhD work uh, doing a project in the Kalahari Desert working on a deep sand wheelchair with indigenous communities and a litany of other um, community members, about 60 people from 25 separate countries, um, doing what seemed to be very participatory, very human-centered work. Um, and we were very excited by it. After three months, three weeks of the um, very intensive project, we all came out with something that seemed very valuable. At the end of the project, however, we thought about sustainability. Uh, one of my other fields around with design is uh, international development. And we ran into an issue of institutional voids. The business, the health, and the engineering issues related to our um, new intervention made us realize that developing the intervention further meant leaving the space that had the problem and working towards um, building the resources and hopefully maybe possibly coming back um, to help support that work. I bring up that story because ever since that occurred, I've been deconstructing and building understanding about all of the ways that innovation as a practice 
very much so follows the same logic, very similar logics to many of the other systems that we're all used to that are currently exploiting the planet. It's recognizing that uh, in many ways, the resources and uh, who benefits, who designs and who creates those uh, technologies, whether tech or otherwise, number one, are extractive and fail to build the agency of the communities that are the most marginalized in many of these situations, whether in Botswana, whether the other communities that have done work, whether that's Arkansas, whether that's Oakland, where I went to um, get my PhD, um, the Bay Area, and having a further conversation about changing the way that we change, whether that is um, understanding uh, ecosystem-centered design, whether that means uh, facilitating different way to build futures for and by the most marginalized. That's uh, the work that I try to engage in, especially when it doesn't have a single clear definition as of yet, because we have yet to make it, because it's been so long since we built systems that don't have that extractive logic. And that's what I'm here representing, and I'm glad to be here to dive into that with the rest of the colleagues. I'm super excited to have you here as well. And we're gonna dive into that, I think, uh, robustly in just a minute. Let me turn first though, um, Rohan, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and also tackle the question of how, how have you seen tech design play out on a global stage? Um, what are the key challenges that you think designers are facing? Yeah, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Firstly, thank you very much for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, so uh, to introduce myself, I'm Rohan Shah and I have my own firm. Uh, so I've been into design thinking uh, field since uh, 2008, uh, started my design since with SAP uh, in Bay Area. And then uh, since last uh, few years, I have my own firm uh, called the Hedwig Innovations, where we primarily focus on the digital designs as well as the experience design. Now, uh, I think uh, the biggest impact, especially the technological uh, environment is concerned, I think the biggest impact that technology will have globally today and in the future will not, will not primarily come from the technology itself, but, but rather from the system, entire system surrounds it, how, how we see the world, how, how we create the value and how we, how we drive innovation. I, I, have, I have always believed that a very goal of the technological advancement should be to increase the quality of human experience. And because of the technological products and systems are so intervened with, with our modern lifestyles, the value that they carry have ability to influence our our, our very experience of life itself. And as a tech designer, I always see that the people use technology for convenience. And, and we have too many options to choose for always, of course, but today. So I think for the technological firm, it is really important to design the product, which provides convenience uh, for sure, with a with great user experience. And, and, and in, in order to achieve that, it is so important to understand the behavior and the lifestyle of people. And that's where the design plays a very critical role in, 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 the, in the tech uh, tech world. Also, I see that when any new technology comes, uh, comes it is not tightly uh, connected with the business or our lifestyle. And that makes it more complicated to determine how and where best apply them. Most, most intelligent technologies are approached in isolation primarily and separate from the core business that they are trying to affect. How, however, true scale will come only when we embed these technologies into the established system, right? So now if, if we want to scale, uh, if we want to talk a little bit about the scaling up globally, then I think if we really want to design the robust technology, which can really scale at a global level, you know, uh, it is extremely important to include diversity uh, across the globe and, and, and co-create. And with that, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about the current pro biggest project, which I have been working and why it is so important and how it's connected. So we are currently uh, working in the innovation initiative with the national youth organization called YI whose primary goal is to promote youth leadership and a nation building in India. In, uh, and the innovation initiative, uh, we call it IDS, which is divided into, of course, three phases, three phases primarily focused on the important national challenges like, like climate change, uh, agriculture, accessibility, 
uh, education, rural rural livelihood, and 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 uh, road safety. Uh, now, now goal is not to innovate technology, but the goal is to design the solution by using the technology with the right application, so that can improve the livelihood of the people in the in the in the uh, in the rural areas and give better convenience and a lifestyle to them. So it's not about designing new technology, it's about designing the right solution by using the existing technologies so we can give better life to people. So, so yeah, that's, that's the, uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, let me turn last to Alexandra, if you would please introduce yourself and share your perspective about how you're seeing tech design play out on the global stage and the key challenges we're encountering. Sure. Well, again, thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited uh, to be included in the in the conversation. Uh, it looks like we're already off to an exciting start. Um, so I come from a little bit of a different background than than all the others here. I, I'm not a designer. I'm actually a political scientist uh, by by training, um, and I sit at the uh, fun and exciting intersection of foreign policy um, and investment, with a particular focus on the emerging markets, um, Africa in particular. So uh, Pierce, we might have a, a little bit to chat about. I've spent quite a bit of time in in Ethiopia and, and Kenya and other parts of the continent as well. Um, I come here wearing several hats, one of them um, being I'm senior non-resident fellow with the Africa Center um, with the Atlantic Council. And I'm also head of research for an uh, innovation investment boutique called the Singularity Group um, here in, in Switzerland, where, where I'm based. Um, so uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Um, and I think from the perspective or, or the question about technology playing out on a global scale and again I, I kind of bring the the macro piece to this I think first you know when we when we speak about technology we sometimes fail to ask whether it exists as a kind of background for our actions or whether there's something else in the background we speak about and tech is often spoken about as applications as gadgets as products whatever it may be um, but I'd actually like to suggest that we increasingly are living in a technological world and tech is becoming the medium. It's actually becoming the environment um, in which we, we operate. And we see this also on, on the level of, of global politics. And I think a very simple, though, a very revealing example, um, there was a few months ago, the French Institute of International Affairs put out a report. And the report is titled Europe in the geopolitics of technology. And it goes on to explore how the EU and member states, how they can become more, more meaningful, more active um, players in what the report sees as this kind of global tech competition. But the framing of the report, I think, is very clear and it's very interesting, suggesting that the EU now operates in an environment that neither it nor any other government, for that matter, created. And it points to it being created by technologists. And you encounter this kind of thinking from the government perspective more and, and more. And so designers, I think, then need to be aware that when they create, um, they're creating something much bigger than uh, an app or a product. You're actually building part of a global platform that's setting the terms for uh, geopolitics, for, for global power competition. You can take, you know, from, from where I sit, 5G cryptocurrencies, which have now, for instance, started to uh, prompt central banks to have their own discussions about digital currencies. And if that evolves, we don't know if it will yet, but if if it does, that would, for, for instance, have potentially huge implications for the global monetary system, or even something as, as seemingly trivial, what, what appeared to be trivial, like social messaging apps, TikTok, WhatsApp, the, the most obvious examples. These are now driving major government decisions about issues like data privacy and surveillance and trade and, and so on each with its own second and third order consequences, most of it which also increasingly evolve around tech. Um, so from that global perspective, I very much think that what we're speaking about today is actually creating the environment in which states act. And to the point very quickly about the challenge, I think for designers that then creates immense responsibilities um, because if we accept that premise, then designers start to shoulder, I think, the burden or the, or the, or the um, benefit, the, the privilege of thinking through the rules and the norms and the values that start to, to govern that, that metaf metaphorical chessboard, if you will, or the norms, rules, values that might emerge from it. 
Um, so there's, there's a lot at play, but I think realizing that technology is increasingly the environment for global politics is also um, an important piece of, of the puzzle and a little bit where I sit and come from. Thank you so much for that powerful connection of the dots. I mean, we're really now, I think, as designers in the thick of it, as you point out, we have choices about specific tools and technologies that we want to build, but that have intense ramifications literally on what's the new system that we're building. How are we really thinking about benefiting everybody? Are we making responsible choices and the right choices? Um, I think, you know, largely designers come in with good intentions, right? And so it's, it's how do we really challenge those intentions and interrogate them and, and ask ourselves, are we really acting on those in the right way. And with that, I would love to turn back um, to Pierce. I, I do want to get into this question of, of, of ultimately how do we start to level up as designers, but first, I think, can we just go back to where does tech design go right? Where does it go wrong? Is there another example from your experience that I think would help us understand how good and intentioned designers might get down the wrong path? I really appreciate that question. Um, I wanted to loop that question back into many of the uh, statements that some of the colleagues have said on the call already, uh, recognizing that uh, my, from where I sit, uh, most, if not all of my answers um, lie from the perspective of understanding equity, um, justice, liberation, and the like, um, even in understanding uh, tech and design, and from where I sit, also innovation, very related, but uh, different spaces. Um, from the, the work that I uh, do, the question that stays in my mind is about um, what does inequity mean in these spaces? Um, I just recently came across an article uh, before, actually, I wrote an article called 100 Racist Design that tries to take a list um, across uh, history, across society, around a litany of different um, examples of uh, things where tech and design go wrong. Um, so particular examples uh, are, for instance, uh, representing how tipping is done by uh, instances like Uber and Instacart um, that was actually, if people didn't know, in the United States, built off of the bones, the institutional and norms based in slavery. Specifically, um, people uh, in many different um, <laughs> restaurants and the like after 1865 when the Civil War was finished, um, they didn't want to pay slaves enough. So the way that people, it's currently, um, the laws are situated, uh, that's, that refuse, that, that, that collateral damage of who gets uh, benefited from the intervention goes into our apps. Uh, that is a powerful um, thing that sustains the way that we think about tech. Um, specifically in Botswana, um, many of the interventions that people are constructing and across the, um, the continent and in the global south as a whole, um, tech sits inside a system of uh, who creates, who uses, and who benefits from the technology in a system that they don't, um, that they don't uh, affect or be a part of, particularly intellectual property. So many different institutions from um, bioharvesting of indigenous plants to um, specific uh, topics of um, traditional discussion um, from, the, from the ideas of how people engage in democracy have been um, taken and used by people that are not from the communities and the benefit does not go to them as well. Those are ways that how it doesn't work, but how it does is when people recognize in many ways how technology is a amplifier for how things can change. Um, things are, in, in many ways, it is an accelerant or for how fast and how many ways people can get information, can uh, utilize tools, can understand information and build agency for themselves and others. So to me, tech gets it right when it recognizes the system that we've already been living in for so long and we build on top of, and also recognizing what matters is building up for the folks that have been experiencing marginalization in a litany of different ways um, to make their lives better. Um, as it has been, um, they've been disenfranchised and disempowered for hundreds, if not thousands of years. 
Thank you, Pierce. Such such really important and powerful points. Appreciate it. Nick, I know you do a lot of consulting with companies that are trying to navigate, trying to do better, and, and are, are facing a lot of challenges when it comes to thinking through design and really truly being of service. How do you coach them? How do you how do you help them? You know, what are the examples that stand out to you about when tech goes right, when tech goes wrong, and, and how do you help them navigate? I think uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I, I think it is worth pointing out, I mean, to, to your point, sort of Fjord is part of a much larger sort of ecosystem inside another organization called Accenture, which is, you know, half a million people or so, so, and global. And um, and so we run into this a lot, right? Which is sort of like how, because, uh, you know, many companies are trying to sort of like cross that, that sort of digital divide. They're trying to figure out where they're going to go to the points that people have made. They're trying to do so ideally in a world that sort of like brings equity as much as possible while still fulfilling their business um, requirements. I don't consider myself a tech designer per se. And I think that that's somewhat like almost a defensive uh, position around sort of like, I think in terms of sort of like the, the, the cultures that will be changed or sort of affected by the design decisions that we create. And to the point of sort of um, that was made around by, by, by Alex, the like tech being sort of an enabler and a substrate across all of the, the, the systems that we have as well as an accelerant to, 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 to your point as well. Like um, I tend to think of, um, of, of sort of how do we think about uh, uh, the decisions that we make, again, going back to that sort of, even if it's local, that's gonna be heard globally, but the, that we're thinking in terms of the values that we're espousing or the principles by which an organization is working. So I kind of go back to the heart of it, which is sort of what are we standing for as an organization that we're working on behalf of and sort of like, how do they project themselves into the world to have the right kind of impact in different places? There's a guy um, uh, called uh, Edward de Bono, who was sort of one of the founders of like this thinking around lateral thinking, which you, you all have may have run into. And he's an intriguing person to, to, to think about. A lot of what we think about is like design thinking workshops came from him. And he has this quote uh, that, uh, that, that I go back to a lot, which is about sort of value concepts tend to chase technology concepts or technology innovation. And technology innovation, technology advance is a form of innovation, but it's not a value innovation. And so to the point that we tend to race forwards in terms of what we can do or approach in terms of technology. And we don't necessarily have an eye to sort of the value concepts that that technology can, can deliver. And so we sort of have to take a step back and, and, and think about what that can be. I think a lot of the, um, the, 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 the work that we're engaged in at this point when we're working on behalf of organizations or organizations design teams or, or, or sort of for ourselves is recognizing, I think, frankly, and we've brought it up already, that we're ill-equipped as sort of an industry to deal with the complexity that we're sort of facing in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the the, the 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 global nature of it, the uh, the different sort of touch points or nodes that we're all often dealing with, um, and that education becomes sort of the the biggest thing. So we're, um, so we spend as much time in our process into your question of trying to sort of create better solutions for people educating ourselves on, on and working with rather than sort of essentially telling people what to do, which was the the, the way that design used to work. Um, uh, because, you know, we know what we don't know now. So, I mean, there's no easy answer to it. It, it happens. It, these things happen all the time. I think uh, it's, it's a big problem for us in terms of working for organizations that are trying to, to sort of turn a corner. Um, but a lot of what we're doing is sort of like, in a sense, going in with humility, trying to teach humility and sort of like share that and, 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 and create those spaces for people. Um, and then uh, and then trying to as understand the world as broadly as we can so that we sort of minimize to, your, to the, the other point sort of unintended consequences or negative impacts on, on different populations. It's a different, it's a very different world than we used to be in for sure. Absolutely. And as I'm speaking of that very different world, um, from your vantage point, where are you seeing the tech design choices go right or go wrong? Sure. Um, uh, echoing sort of uh, what, what Pierce has uh, mentioned, no, it goes right where, where it amplifies communities and, and amplifies um, voices. So, um, but I think where I've seen um, it go quote unquote wrong is often when it's too narrowly focused on, on having a certain very specific social impact solution. So much so that it um, perhaps fails to see where other um, social 
other products, excuse me, that are less focused on uh, social impact might be more meaningful. And I'll give an example to, to clarify uh, what I mean from particularly the standpoint of of emerging markets and, and the African region in particular, um, of course, given the many challenges that, that the region faces, coupled with the um, dynamism and the innovation that's unfolding in, in many corners, the continent is attracting many tech investors and entrepreneurs and designers that attracted some 500 million in, in tech funding in, in 2019. And most who come come with the aim of, of solving some problem, whether it's healthcare or women's issues or uh, clean water, financial inclusion, you, you name it, somebody's trying to do it. And that's all well and good and that's very needed. So, so don't misunderstand me. But oftentimes other technologies or other applications that perhaps don't really fit into that social impact solution bucket, they end up being sidelined, even though their reach could also be significant. And, and one very brief example about which I've, I've also spoken about and written um, is, is the gaming industry and the uh, creative industries um, more broadly. Uh, throughout much of the African continent, the gaming industry is, is growing rapidly, propelled by a whole host of factors, also film tech, music tech. Um, they're, uh, they're really booming and increasingly we're seeing that they're contributing to solving many of the region's job creation challenges, um, creating uh, employment opportunities for uh, youth, also encouraging uh, STEM education for, you know, young, young students who are interested in, in, in coding then with the view of going into some of these sectors. But because it's hard to frame gaming tech or music tech or whatever it might be um, as a social impact kind of industry, um, they often end up being overlooked. Uh, all of which is to say it's, it's great to want to um, so design tech to solve for a particular problem or a particular set of problems. But I think it's also important to be aware that the solutions that we're seeking might also sometimes come from uh, unexpected uh, places like gaming or, or film, whatever it might be. So I think tech um, doesn't go wrong, but maybe stumbles a bit when it's too, too narrow minded in some respects. Thank you, Alexander. That's awesome. Uh, Rohan, I wanted to turn to you with a question to build on this conversation, which is how do we as designers start to make more inclusive choices? How do we think about including those that have historically been excluded? Um, what, how do we level up as designers ultimately? Sure, uh, sure. So uh, first of all, I, I, I love this question because this is exactly I've been working towards, uh, towards for a, a long time, especially with the businesses. So to make the technology more inclusive, uh, I, I say that don't think about technology at all uh, initially. Uh, just uh, uh, just park aside as a des uh, uh, at the design stage because if you if you really ask yourself why do we need technology at the very first place, the answer is to make the process more efficient, make the the outcome more efficient. Now now if uh, let me uh, let, let me go a step further here. What happens if the process uh, becomes more efficient? The, the answer is the people becomes more efficient or my customer gets better experience. Then why not to start with the people at the very first stage, right? So that is where include them. So to make them inclusive, we, when we start, we include them at the very first point, our users, and make sure that they are part of the design. They are part of the uh, solution. Uh, and, and we translate, and I want to club this uh, answer with the, with the previous question where design go wrong at times because sometimes even the tech design problems and we directly convert uh, as we said you know design thinking is is broadly said as a problem solving approach but if we solve the problem uh, sometimes we end up solving the process problems or the systems problems it is what what is important is how do we translate that process problem or system problem to the human problem the more you just have to convert their problem to the human problem human centric and then try to co-create with your people include that the adaptation will be more easier rather than mandating the changes for the people so i think that's 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 where the the design human centered design plays a, a very uh, effective role so. yeah andy i wanted to turn to you as well on this one so how how do we level up as designers what can we do to actually be be thinking more comprehensively about that sign? Um, I think there's a couple of things that we've touched on, but maybe need to be called out already. So the first is 
bringing a systems lens to the types of problems that we are working uh, to solve. Um, and I think that's what we're going to start to see. I mean, we've seen it already a little bit in the shift of the way design is approaching things. Um, but, you know, we uh, in design, we're trained to like frame the problem and really unpack what it is, but we're still looking for problems and the things that are successful in the tech design world right now are discreet. They're like nice and easy. The stuff that we really need to start solving, it is gnarly and in interconnected and super messy. And that's a lot harder when you're driven sort of um, in, in a corporate mindset, that's harder to tackle. So I think um, part of it is you know, as we're leveling up around uh, design and designers and the skills we need. So that ability to think in systems um, and getting really uncomfortable with the messiness of that. I think along with that is understanding our relationship to the type of work that we're working on. Um, so our social identities are um, really important to the way we see the world and experience the world and the way the world sees and experiences us and getting better clarity around the problem we're solving and our relationship to them to start to understand the interconnectedness um, and build some of those, you know, uh, the lens of equity that Pierce was talking about earlier into it because the types of problems we need to solve are not discrete. Um, and so I think that's where we're really going to start to see other disciplines get infused into design. And so as Nick mentioned earlier, this evolution of like it just being like product, this glossy layer over top, now much more interconnected in the business realm of like business design and those things linked together. I think we're starting to see it transition into the social innovation space, into public sector, so that we can really tackle the things that are beyond just the experience of, can I get my food delivered faster? That, you know, like, yes, that's an improved human experience, but can we solve world hunger? Um, and so starting to shift the types of problems uh, and the way we think about them. Really powerful questions, Andy, and I'm seeing lots of nods among our panelists. So I wanna give you all a chance to jump in and build. Um, is anyone want to jump in and, and take it up, Andy? I think that there's something really interesting. I mean, Andy, to your point, the um, the incentive that that sort of design has followed and 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 um, and, and is moving away from to some degree, I hope, is uh, sort of really around sort of economies, right? So like, we'll make things faster, we'll make things smoother, we'll remove the sort of the bumps and the the, the odd shapes from things um, into something that is much more holistic. I mean, I, I think you know, speaking. On behalf of, of, of my side of the, of the table and sort of my organization, what's been really interesting is the bringing in of more constituents, even on sort of the, the creator side, um, to reflect the fact that sort of when we were trained in, in our craft, sort of all of us collectively, wherever we came from, to sort of, Andy, to your point, sort of identify a problem and then to solve against that problem. And that problem has to be discreet enough to solve against. Otherwise, you're sort of, you know, you're boiling the ocean. The, your stakeholders aren't getting whether they're public sector or whether they're uh, on the professional side. They're not getting, you know, they're not getting a solve basically, right? And the, the problem becomes exponentially larger. To solve those larger scale problems, though, we need any number of other skill sets involved to sort of to understand sort of the, the the breadth of it, but then also to sort of navigate our way through it. And so, the rise of sort of strategy and business design over the last ten years, and even design research fifteen years ago, twenty years ago now. Um, and now we're starting to see sort of data being layered onto it and any number of other systems that are sort of being put on top of what we would consider a core sort of design attribute. And design, again, is, is changing manifestly even in the definition of the word, but it's really to reflect on the fact that sort of if we're going to design a an individual thing, we have to be looking at sort of onion skins of the impact that it has and sort of where that one inflection point is coming from so that we can even identify what the, the real problem is. I mean, it's a, a sort of a truism in the design process that the first thing that you do is that you go back and you sort of ask what the real problem is. Somebody gives you a problem and you sort of, you know, you look at the ecosystem around it and then you realize that the ultimate unlock, the real problem is somewhere totally different. And what we're realizing now is that the, the ultimate problem is sociocultural and it's going to require any number of little pieces to sort of come into play. And, um, and so sort of culture design becomes a bigger thing sort of and, and on all of those things. But I, yeah, it's it's very much emblematic. Like what we're saying is very much emblematic of sort of the design experience more broadly, which is sort of much more of an ecosystem, much more of a, a broad subject matter 
uh, discipline uh, situation and the reflection that design problems aren't singular, they're sort of manifest across, across worlds. I want to hit on that point as well, because um, I think it's really critical um, that we recognize in the world of design, even with the, um, the valuable and important methods that Nick suggests in um, understanding how design can help tackle mm -hmm. more of these ha, wicked, thorny, um, mm -hmm. multidimensional, uh, cross uh, community problems, that we also recognize the limits of the field of design, right? The yeah. limits of, especially not only like the limits of the theory, because that's something that we all have had a, a deep dive into in our worlds and concepts and ideas, but understand how the industry, how the social relationships and how the specifically the community of people that call themselves designers, the limits of them as a whole. Um, and honestly, what that brings us back to is idea, the, the limit of how we've conceived of the human as a concept in doing human-centered design. Um, in, in one of my favorite tweets from the community um, that I learned the most from uh, discuss the real, the real paradox, the real um, conflict of recognizing the idea of human-centered design when not everybody that is in the world that is considered as um, important to study is considered a human, right? That's one of the main reasons why I discuss these ideas of equity and justice in these concepts, not only because um, they're, the inequity is rife in society, not just by um, race, but by nationality, by uh, ability, by gender, by sexual identity, all, all these different things that uh, we can speak a bit on, but also how designers consider it important to define themselves in the humanity they're using in their work. Right? Usually, humanity means consumer. It means user. It means in the way that most of us do our and are trained to be able to do our work is connected to that economic structure of one sliver of what it means to be a, a human. But we all contain multitudes in this work. We have somebody um, that designers could absolutely learn so much more from, specifically that deals with political and social environments um, that talk about the holistic idea of um, the issues of humans engaging in democracy that many designers, they, they it's just a whole other world that they haven't had a chance to dive into. And arguably, if they do dive into them, uh, could <laughs> extract and utilize it for their own benefit, i.e. colonize their information and their language for their ideas. That's a problem. That's the same logic that we were talking about before that we need to get away from. And the way we do so is recognizing and building agency for other people's communities, ideas, not just their skills, right? But what other ways of being human, other epistemologies, other ontologies, other beliefs, um, indigenous communities, uh, marginalized identities, uh, people that uh, live with disabilities every single day, people uh, that have to, in, in the work that we try to talk about in equity innovation is more of a promise than a, than a foundation in the work. It's recognizing the expertise and the ability to design of the people that have experienced the real struggles of our society, the most marginalized, including those without a voice, like people that are not human and people that are in the future. And recognizing that is essential in understanding how we need to redevelop what it means to do this design well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really at the heart of our conversation today is how do we actually set paths forward that enable us to design? And I think one of the challenges, um, Chris, to your point, is um, what happens when we as designers have our fundamental assumptions questioned? So there's a really a piece that I'm really proud of that the Geotech Center did um, actually in partnership with Accenture on indigenous data sovereignty. And we had a conversation about how do indigenous peoples view their data? And I honestly had a mind blown moment when when one of our panelists said, my data, my personal genetic data isn't actually my data, it's my people's data. And what I share has ramifications for my, my collective group that I'm a part of. And that was pretty mind blowing because I think for a lot of us in the tech and data community, we really do see our genetic data as our data as our own, but it has really complex ramifications. So, and, and I think we have to help our designers really figure out how do we sort of, when we encounter those, those notions that challenge us, really integrate them and begin to develop paths forward that do indeed have this systemic implications and start to shift the system and, and take that systemic approach. 
Um, I do want to make sure we, in the time that we have remaining, we do get to a couple questions from the audience. So I am going to put a pin in this conversation, but clearly there is a lot we have to discuss, unpack, and navigate forward. And I'm so excited to be part of a, a group with all of you where we're thinking about these questions, we're having these important discussions, and we're trying to help build these paths forward. So, um, Alexandra, let me turn to you with one of the questions, and I think, I think you'd be well suited to answer this one, which is when we think about human-centered perspectives, how do we think about this from a geopolitical standpoint? especially when the biggest companies are multinational already, they do business in countries around the world, um, and maybe that values are different. We might even encounter challenges in democratic values, for example, or, or different, and these can you know, vary on company perspective, national perspective. So how do, how do you see us navigating these kinds of choices from a, from a human center lens? Sure. Well, I, I don't know that I can speak so much from from the human centered design lens. That's not my that's not my bread and butter. So I would defer that to all the other uh, clever colleagues on on the call. Um, but I think from from the geopolitical perspective and from a values perspective, uh, there are tensions. There are very clear tensions that are at play. There are tensions between um, systems that focus on um, yeah, values that center around individual liberty, freedom, democracy, and there are, of course, many variations and variances within that. Um, even here in Europe, uh, the idea where from my perch, the Swiss perceive democracy in a very different way than their neighbors, the, the, the Germans. Um, I think part of the complexity uh, of of design and part of the challenge from a geopolitical perspective um, is that it's difficult to to encapsulate uh, everything and and everyone at the end of the day. I, I kind of in in listening to the to the prior discussion, um, Andy's point about systems thinking and the conversations that we've been we've been having about values. Um, I've kind of been drawn back to uh, John Locke, actually. Um, he had his theory of, of abstraction, and I'm going to paraphrase and probably paraphrase badly, but I'll give it a shot. And you know, John Locke made the point that we all have ideas that are based on particular experiences, and we define those using words. But if we defined every particular experience with words and names, we would run into the problem of infinite names. So mind, he goes on to argue the mind uh, aggregates those in a way into what we might now call mental experiences and mental models that are devoid of place, devoid of location, and so on and so forth. And I think that that similar principle applies here today and, and ties into a little bit of, of the conversation that, that we've been having. I think in the effort to want to be more inclusive, we've gone perhaps in the direction of, of naming, naming individuals, naming communities, naming groups, who's included, who's potentially excluded with a view to then wanting to uh, rightfully include them. Um, but I think we end up running into the problem of, of infinite names. Uh, the world, uh, it, like Pierce said, we contain multitudes. The world contain multitudes. So I circle back to, to solving for values and for principles. Um, and I think holding to the constituents, to the stakeholders, uh, whether that's companies, whether that's states, whether that's entrepreneurs, wherever they might be, that, that share those values that we define and being open to the reality that there's always going to be uh, a different set of, of values. Um, and we need to do our best as designers, as folks in foreign policy to, to try to solve for them. Um, and, and, but that might not always uh, work in, in our favor, which I guess isn't sort of the uh, uh, glamorous, you know, overly optimistic answer that that some would hope for. But I think we also have to, you know, be clear as to what we're what we're um, what we're dealing with and up against. These are, as we've said, thorny and, and complex issues. Absolutely. And we have a few other questions. Unfortunately, I think we really are at time and should get to our, our lightning round. So I'd like to hear from each of you two to three tweet link recommendations and or synthesis. If there's a last point you want to make, please do, do take this moment to, to make it and, and kind of close out your, your thinking on today's discussion. Um, I will give you all an opportunity that we'll make sure that the questions are shared and that if we have a chance to respond to them in the chats or whatnot, we'll, we'll give you all, all that chance to do so as well. So let me first uh, go to you, Rohan. Um, what are your two to three recommendations for policymakers, for folks in business to be, to be thinking about how do they navigate these, these tough issues and, and, and what are some of your thoughts on today's conversation? 
So, so yeah, I, I always focus. Uh, I always uh, say that that you know, if, if in anything with the policy, you know, if the if it's it's always focused on the people and their needs and and what makes them more efficient and give them convenience. If if the policy is creating the challenge for the people, then don't question people, question policy at the first time and try to design because it's it's uh, uh, policy is for the people's benefit. So uh, they should be at the center of the design. Uh, so I, I think. That that is that is always the core, the human center. So, yeah. Alexandra, can I go to you next? What are what are your your recommendations? Uh, I guess lightning round. Um, I think going back, realize that tech today is starting setting the rules uh, for under which great questions of geopolitics are now taking place. So uh, tread carefully, uh, and then perhaps uh, to my prior point, design um, perhaps not for groups but for values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nick, what are, what are your thoughts? I think uh, just I would echo the values over sort of any individual endpoints at the outset, sort of like live to those sort of values, those higher level principles, um, recognize the context of use. So really sort of, uh, sort of explore, uh, this is the time to double down on uh, what we would consider longitudinal research, be in the, the, the places ground truthing is incredibly important. So sort of understand as much as you can the impact that you'll have um, and, and as well as the unintended impact of the decisions that you're gonna make. Um, so that you don't inadvertently kind of create harm um, as, as much as possible. And the last thing I think that, that perhaps is most important is this is a moving target. Um, our solutions now are not going to be our solutions a year or two down the road, especially as we're coming through sort of the accelerator that was the pandemic uh, um, and as the design industry and the, the, the world that we're in has changed. So um, we're moving, we're changing, the world is changing around us and we have to keep sort of re-imagining um, what it is that we're doing um, and how we're doing it in order to sort of to, to tackle those things. And so sort of the, I'm looking forward to the next generation of what designer and design thinkers bring um, to sort of to push the craft forward as well. Absolutely. Pierce, what are your two to three, two to three tweet length recommendations for us? First of all, I want to thank you, Stephanie, because I'm glad you, add, you added in who are we directing these statements to. So I'm going to direct them specifically to certain people. For politicians, build agency for those on the margins. You might ask what exactly that mean. That might look like inclusion um, policy. That might look like uh, benefit sharing plans or uh, developing collaborative participatory design platforms to develop um, policies or products or services or experiences or training, right? Talking about the entire um, supply chain of anything that is created for the future. For everyone else, especially designers, recognize your power in shaping and shepherding futures. And while you're doing so, you should ask yourself the question, am I doing it for the people that are in dominating places, places of domination for that sake, or am I doing it to build power in everybody? And for everybody else, I would ask the question, does technology shape issues by itself? Or are there humans behind them that are developing, creating, and benefiting from those technologies? And how are they holding and shaping power and towards what purpose, especially in dealing with democratic and other systems, that this is the same thing that people have been doing for a long period of time. Technology has history from, the word has history in the 1800s, right? However, we need to understand that there are people behind them creating and benefiting from those technologies if we're going to build something that, in a world that we can all live in. And Andy, if something is of a spark for this conversation, I wanted to, to give you the final word. Um, what are your two to three to be length recommendations for us? All right. When I think of this, I'm going to try not to repeat anything that's been said. Um, I think it's really important to get out of your bubble, whether that's the design world, whether that's the innovation community. The only way you're going to start to see things differently is to interact and engage with those who see and experience the world differently and starting to build, you know, to Alexandra's point around shared values. Shared values come through conversation and working together. They cannot be assumed. Um, and we need to talk about the processes by which those shared values are being created. So getting out of your bubble and into community. Um, and as part of that teaching, your teams, um, whether they're design or otherwise, about you know power and intersectionality and systems thinking, because those are tools that will help us have 
more collaborative conversations around the historical foundations that tech design is being built on and the imagination that's required for us to actually conceive of uh, a shared world where we can all prosper. Beautifully put. And um, to this group, I would say if there are any resources you'd like to make sure that we attach to our event page um, that can help our audience think about these kinds of complex issues, I welcome them. We'll make sure we get them attached. To all of our panelists today, thank you so much for joining this conversation. It was incredible. I truly thank you for getting me out of my own personal bubble today to think more broadly and expansively about design. Of course, I thank our audience for joining us today uh, and, and being a part of this incredible conversation. So, so thank you. And with that, I wish you all an incredible day uh, and continued success in your work ahead on these important problems. Thanks so much. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.